Union Bank is proud to support Lost LA. LA isn't one city, but many. Different communities live side by side, often divided by invisible lines. In the 20th century, not everyone shared the opportunity to live freely, to eat and drink, to work and gather where they wanted. This time on Lost LA, we'll navigate these hidden worlds through two underground guidebooks from the archives. I'm Nathan Masters, and this is Lost LA. Many people see LA as a city of the future, a place without a past, a freeway metropolis that sprang up fully formed in the 20th century. But the roots of Southern California history run deep. People have called this land home for thousands of years, and their stories give us a richer understanding of where we are now and where we're headed in the decades to come. So let's look back and uncover some of these forgotten stories in the archives. Lost LA explores Southern California history by bringing archival materials to life. In the 30s, the American vacation hit the road. Members of the growing black middle class bought cars and set out on highways to see America. But discrimination and danger followed them from coast to coast, including to LA. How did black travelers get the information they needed to stay safe? The answer, the Green Book. If you ever plan to move away. Route 66 is this sort of extraordinary moment in American history. After World War II, you finally have automobiles at a price point that Americans can afford, and you've got an infrastructure of highways that Americans can travel on. And now the road is completely open to you. But it's much more than simply the practical. It's sort of this imagined space of, this is what America means. What is more Americana than driving in Wyoming and there's literally 100 miles and there's nobody around? Now what's more American than arriving at Route 66 and you're in Los Angeles? It's Hollywood. The juxtaposition between the freedom that was Route 66 for most Americans and the complexities of Jim Crow America for black Americans means that Route 66 ironically means not freedom for blacks, it just means here's one more extraordinary opportunity that I have to negotiate. It's not just simply going to be handed to me. Victor Green was a postal worker, and he was also an activist who founded this Green Book Guide for Negro Travelers in the 1930s. Victor Green created the Green Book because he saw a need to provide listings of accommodations to the newly traveling African-American class. As the consumer culture was growing in terms of American identity, African-Americans wanted to um, travel around the country and experience places and new cities in the United States, just like whites did. But similar to Route 66, when you're in the West, you have an expectation that you'll be treated as a full citizen, that the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment are actually going to apply. What happens if you're black and you arrive into the West and this is it? There is no River Jordan to cross. There is no other place to go to. If you're in Los Angeles and you're black and this is all there is, then what, what does it mean to be black? And what does it mean to be an American? When you realize that the entire nation state embodies Jim Crow America, Sundown towns in many ways embody that, meaning that when we are in white residential communities, we have an expectation that those people who are Negroes will not be here when the sun goes down. And the implicit threat is, if you happen to be in town and visible when the sun goes down, then you are subject to police. Because the entity that helps to enforce the white racial segregation of a space is gonna, of course, be the police force. The Green Book was a guide to help African Americans figure out how to travel safely. It gave them lists of hotels, restaurants, uh, guest houses. So it gave African Americans much more freedom uh, to move around the country once they figured out where they could stop and not have to be impacted by discrimination. That was an identity that Victor Green was thinking about. He's thinking about African Americans as Americans who want to utilize uh, the car to travel around to uh, various parts of the United States, just like white Americans did. It became a universal value. It allowed you a bit to be predictive. 
What I mean by that is if you know that there is 175 miles away a location where you can spend the night, then you can plan your trip accordingly. If you know that the next gas station where you're going to be comfortably served is 75 miles away, then you get enough gas to get you from that gas station to the next. Clifton's was this remarkable terminus of Route 66. It was the end of uh, the Mother Road for so many travelers. What was absolutely beautiful about Clifton's was it was also listed in the Green Book, which meant that the black travelers of that era knew that there was a safe haven and there was this wonderful place that would embrace them and welcome them with open arms to the Los Angeles that they had hoped existed. The people who came on Route 66, it was a combination of people who were both sort of a new leisure class, but also people who were sort of escaping prejudice repercussions in, in their own communities. And they were looking for sort of this, this wonderful new horizon. Clifford Clinton wanted to demonstrate that that actually existed. If it didn't exist in its entirety, it existed at least in one location. And so when they arrived, there was this city that opened its arms to them. And the location became known as exemplifying the philosophy that, that we wanted to see Los Angeles become, and we wanted Californians to represent, not just in fantasy, but in reality. What made locations special in Los Angeles was because you had a large black ownership population in and around Central Avenue. And so in many ways, um, the extant buildings that are still there in 2017 are a representation of this um, concentration of black-owned businesses. So what's a little bit different in Los Angeles is that you've got a concentration of businesses and the Green Book just simply says, hey, let's take you to Angela's Funeral Home, let's take you to Jack Sh um, Chicken Shack. And then when you're there, you're like, that's the Club Alabama. That's the Dunbar. Here's another hotel. Um, I want to go and be here. The Green Book had many locations in the Los Angeles region, and one was the La Bonita at one point in, but also it was a restaurant and bar. La Bonita had been in existence since 1914, and it was a place for accommodations to eat, to rent a room, and in the early part of the century, people rented bathing suits there, and it was close to the beach site uh, that African Americans frequented in Santa Monica near Pico. And that um, place got the name of the Inkwell. I'm so tired. The LA NAACP wanted to host the National Convention, which they will do in 1913. And when they host, they realize that there is not a residential space, meaning hotel, that will accept blacks. And so this guy by the name of John Somerville, he was also involved with the local chapter of the NAACP. The Somervilles wanted to do two things. They recognized that this is Jim Crow America, that there were a number of blacks as well as you know, celebrities, um, dignitaries who would arrive in Los Angeles and be subject to Jim Crow America. And they believed that it was more important to have a space that was available for blacks as a hotel, that they would be served in the way that they would expect to be served. The original name of the hotel was the Somerville. It gets renamed after Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the Dunbar. And because of its location, 41st and 42nd Street and Central Avenue, the Dunbar becomes this anchor. After the Dunbar, businesses are going to in many ways sort of migrate south around it because if you've got a population of people who have resources, who are staying there and traveling, what do they want to do? They want to eat. They want to be entertained. They want to get their drink on. They want to hang out with people. They need to go to church. So all of the secondary businesses and secondary institutions that are developed are going to develop around the Dunbar. So the Dunbar becomes a very, very, very critical space to develop what eventually happens around Central Avenue in post-World War II. The passing of the Civil Rights Act of 64 was very impactful to the Green Book. It said in writing 
legislatively that African Americans could not be discriminated against in public accommodations. On a personal note, I believe that I'm the first generation of blacks who actually enjoy the full benefits of this society. Not my parents, certainly not my grandparents. Blacks are still being killed within the United States. And travel in the United States for blacks has always been fraught with danger. Certainly at the filming of this particular segment, as we think about what's the relationship between the Green Book and the contemporary moment, it's complicated. The black condition with the United States in the contemporary moment when it comes to safety, like a bad relationship, is complicated. But if there's something that changes after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, it means that for the first time, a kid can get a PhD from USC and become a historian and say something. I think that's extraordinary. And I think that's what it means. Imagine wanting to meet your friends for a drink, but you couldn't. It's illegal to gather, to dance, or touch. That's what it was like to be gay in Los Angeles in the 60s and 70s, and it drove queer culture underground. The community needed ways to build relationships, share information, and create solidarity. But how could they find one another? One little guidebook was a big help. It was called the Address Book. This is the earliest Bob Dameron's guide that we have from 1965. You notice that it just says the address book. There's no reference to LGBT, gay or lesbian on it. You could put this in your back pocket and if you were discovered by the police, you could simply throw it in the bushes and then no one would ever know what its meaning was. I know that we're an archive, but there's something really fascinating about the way that people are drawn to this space. Community has become really dispersed in recent years. Um, places like um, the city of West Hollywood, which were predominantly gay, are now changing in terms of the makeup. Um, Silver Lake, downtown, they've changed radically. From people who use these serial resources or periodicals that we have in the collection, it was really a great thing for them because they could find access to a number of people like themselves. Sometimes when I tour them through the rooms downstairs and they look at these periodicals, they're so thrilled that they actually get teary-eyed um, because this was the first magazine that I ever knew that I could find somebody like myself. This was the only time I could ever really know that there was somebody like me. And the guides were also interesting because they allowed you to make an initial contact. You'd find one contact and then that contact would lead you to four or five others and then each of them subsequently would lead you to four or five others so you would know where the other places were so that you could you know begin to go and meet other people like yourself it went from being a tiny tiny little publication to something by the 1990s that had hundreds of pages and over a very short period of time they began to have codes there was an elaborate code by the time you get to the 1990s if you were traveling, if you were driving across country, you'd pick up a Dameron's guide and you'd open it up and they had listings for all the gay bars, any restaurants that were queer or queer friendly. And it was essential because you'd be stuck in some small town and you'd feel really isolated. And you weren't sure, especially in some areas where it was safe for you to stay. Now, looking back on them, it's such a great source of information as to where queer communities were, where the sort of gay neighborhoods were at different times and places. I'm Peter Alexander. I'm Scott Craig. And we are in Akbar <laughs> on the corner of Sunset and Fountain in Silver Lake, Los Angeles. That's two words, Silver Lake. That's we had Bob Dameron's guide when we went. We used to be they together. They were essential. And we would travel and go to Europe and then, uh, like, where are we going? We're going to be in London and Paris and Florence and Rome. And we would just photocopy just those pages. Once you came into a gay bar, then you were in a safe place and you could be yourself. You could let down your guard. You could breathe easier. If you noticed a lot of the gay bars, 
didn't have windows much because it was just a door and you went inside. This one has actually, our bar here has a window that's been blocked over. Couple. Um, that one had something in the way. Because Bricks they could were, come flying in. <laughs> yes, because, yeah, uh, it was a safety issue. It was a dangerous thing to be going into a gay bar. I mean, how many times were eggs thrown? We've had, we've still been happens. Eggs. Yeah, still happens still here. It's occasionally. So. It was your idea to put up the gay flag, the rainbow flag up yeah. front, right? It's after uh, Prop Proposition 8, eight. yeah. Yeah, we, we would get these people would say, is that a gay bar, is that a gay bar? And then we're finally, you know, after a while saying, well, we you know, say everyone's we, welcome. Well, everyone's welcome. And then after just the hate and the vitriol of Proposition 8, we're like, yeah. Yes, it, we, are we are a gay, gay bar. bar. We have an interview here between Lisa Ben and Donna Smith in the old days in which they're talking about going to the IF Club, which used to be down on Western. And um, Lisa Ben expresses her delight at going into the space and finding out that someone had had their birthday party there. They took me to a place called the IF, and that was the very first gay place, gay bar that I had ever been to. The first time I walked in the door with my friends, why there was someone coming up to one of the booths with a lighted, uh, with a birthday cake with lighted candles and all the girls were singing happy birthday to you to some girl in the booth. And uh, oh, I just thought, isn't that wonderful? And tears came to my <laughs> eyes and I was so thrilled that uh, this place was only for girls. These spaces provided safe spaces for people to go. For gay bars, they were often, you had to go through an alley, through a back door. It was often dark. You were afraid that somebody was gonna be there with a baseball bat or something to beat you. Um, and so you actually were filled with trepidation. It was a heady experience. There was a free zone of excitement where you would go towards the door and there would be this fear that somebody was gonna come after you, but simultaneously the excitement that you were doing something that was really exciting. Like Hello, I'm Mark Bellinger, Curator and Community Development for the Tom of Finland Foundation. I would like to welcome you to what we officially call Tom House. We were recently granted a cultural historic monument status within the city of Los Angeles. The piece that kind of represents the beginning of the foundation collection would be this large canvas. This is George Quaintance, Bob Miser from Physique Pictorial came to Tom after George died and said, I want to publish you as my, as my cover guy. I have a great example over here of the first time his work was published in Physique Pictorial. We have so many stories of people from small towns finding the Physique Pictorial and sneaking behind the counter and stealing it. And, and you know, it was kind of their, their opening to, to the world. I knew at a very young age that, that I was different. There were a lot of us that, that were different, but I was even a little more different than the boys who were different. I saw Tom's work, and I knew that at least there was one other person out there, and it really freed me up. It allowed me to be what I am and revel in my sexuality and celebrate it rather than push it back into the closet and hide it and, and be ashamed of it. The opposite of pride is shame. And Tom's work is utterly 100% without shame. We deal in art here, uh, which we consider contemporary art because we were around when it was made. Uh, there's a visitor that comes here who is 25 years old, so automatically it's not contemporary for them, it's historical. So our obligation is always to attach history and humanity to the visual arts. That these guys are outside in a Tom's drawing, uh, in a public park, but it's daytime, and trying to give the context of what it was like when that drawing was done in 1968, let's give the historic context of what it would have been like to actually do that in a public park in Helsinki. Uh, and, and, and the horrors that we've known and, and having to jump out of bar room uh, back doors and windows out of bathrooms so you wouldn't be arrested. I think it's important to talk about that history because it gives context to where we are today. 
I think the laws were interpreted however people wanted to interpret them. If they sent an undercover cop into the bar and you were touching another person, that was considered to be illegal. And so therefore, I mean, it didn't mean that you had to be having some really intimate contact with them. It could just be having your arm around someone's neck or, or kissing someone that was licensed to take you to jail. Um, and then the problem would be that once you got into jail, if anybody found out about it at your work, you could be blacklisted and fired on the spot. I am Alexei Romanov. We're in the Black Cat. It was one of the bars that was raided on New Year's Eve of 1966. They just had finished playing Old Lang Syne, and everybody uh, kind of grabbed each other and were just giving kisses and saying Happy New Year. They hadn't been aware, but there were undercover police officers in the bar. The police grabbed two people because they were kissing. They didn't really identify themselves. And they went and they grabbed them and they beat them. And they beat them severely. And the people in here were beat severely. The next day, the phones were just ringing and ringing because the brutality that happened here. That was the emphasis to get us moving when we heard about that. We needed to change that. We needed to stop that harassment. So we started to organize on February 11th, 1967. For the first time in this nation's history, 500 to 600 gay men, lesbians, and those who support us came to demonstrate for our civil rights. When I talk about the demonstration here, 500 to 600 people, I'm not degradating Stonewall. Stonewall was a riot. It was a necessity. It brought the, the action out in our community. I celebrate them, and I don't try to take anything away from what they did, but it was different. It was the first in the world. Two years before the Stonewall riots in New York City, they were the Black Cat protests. And here tonight, this crowd is celebrating LA history. When we had the 50 year reenactment of the demonstration, they had posters made up that were identical to the signs that people were holding. There's a one picture where there are three people. The mayor stood in the middle, the city councilman stood stood to his right, I stood to his left. It touched my heart, but we got this place designated as a historical landmark. It's the first gay historical landmark in California and in the country. A lot has changed, but a lot hasn't, and a lot still needs to be changed in order to make equality real for everybody. For me, you know, it's so important that I maintain this archive to sort of have that story exist into the future. I often talk about the future of the queer past, how our past as a collective group of people is cobbled together and is f formative in the way that we think about who we will be in the future. And I think so many things that we can think of that we will be um, need to be tempered by an understanding of what came before us to make sure that we're not making the same mistakes and to be sure that we've learned some lessons along the way and can apply those to the solutions that we're producing for the future. The tension between pride in one's own culture and navigating the larger American society is something the black and queer communities have in common with all immigrants to our city. On the next Lost LA, we'll consider how the city's historical ties across the Pacific turned it into the cultural mosaic we know today. Lost LA was made possible by the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, the California State Library, and California Humanities. 
Union Bank is proud to support Lost LA.